The following presentation was recorded at the Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, please visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors for helping make these videos possible. Oh yeah, I was gonna say it's it's 9 a.m. on a convention on a Friday. It's uh it's early. So welcome. Anyway, let me get back to my uh, my script. So I'm uh, Nick Everett, a paid full time contributor. Am I okay? Good. I'm a, I'm a paid full time contributor to Elasticsearch. I work for Elastic. Before that, I worked for the Wikimedia Foundation on search, and that's why I'm contributing to Elasticsearch. There's nothing interesting on here yet. It'll come. Give me a couple slides. They get, they get them. Thank you. <laughs> so I've been contributing to Elasticsearch on and off for about four years, just under at this point. Uh, so my plan today is to show you at a high level how Elasticsearch works. And my goal is to put as many diagrams and data structures in front of you as you can take on a Friday. My guess is that's about 25 minutes of them. And then you'll be done. So let's do it. So before I get to diagrams and data structures, I'll tell you what Elasticsearch is, at least what we call it. We say that Elasticsearch is a distributed search and analytics engine. We don't say it's a database. Uh, people get angry when we say that. Uh, so I highlight words because because they're important, and I'm going to kind of define them. And as a thread throughout the rest of this talk, I'll make them make more sense. So loosely, distributed here means that the data is stored on multiple computers, multiple nodes, multiple processes that communicate over the network that they live on separate hardware. This hardware all has to live in the same data center, at least at this point it does. We're slowly getting to the point where we have cluster replication, uh, which would allow us to replicate outside of the data center. And just very recently, we have the ability to do cross-cluster search outside of the data center. So search here means that Elasticsearch has fancy full-text search, mostly analysis and scoring. And I will get in a little bit of depth about analysis, but I won't go into a ton of depth about scoring. Uh, the upshot about scoring is uh, in a normal database, in a, in a normal system, when you say, uh, I want to find all the documents that look like this, you get back all the documents that look like this. It arbitrarily, yeah. in whatever way you are in the system. But Elasticsearch doesn't do that. I mean, you can ask it to sort it arbitrarily, but it, the default is to sort by this thing. Or score is applying math to your query and the document to come up with some relative score uh, across the other documents. So it tries to give you the bestest document. Analytics here means that Elasticsearch supports some fancy ways to aggregate your data and slice and dice those aggregations. Um, I won't go too deeply into depth about all the aggregations you can do, you can look those up online. There's no point in coming to listen to me for a talk for those. But I will talk about how the aggregations, how the aggregations work, and the data structures that make them go. Uh, and I'll give you some sort of basic examples of the aggregations as we go. So, still not diagram time. The API looks like this. You interact with it with HTTP. You interact with it with, with HTTP, uh, and because everyone can read curl, I put curl on here. And actually, this is like a running theme. Years ago, the only way you could file a bug report against Elasticsearch was with curl. There were like dozens of, well, right now there are two dozen uh, API, like two dozen libraries that you can use to interact with Elasticsearch, right? There's like a Java one, and there's a Scala one, and there's a Haskell one, and there's a JavaScript, da 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 da. There's tons of them, but I can only read a couple of programming languages. And if you come to me with, you know, your weird Ruby library with all this strange magic that's inside, I can't help you, right? So the bug reports had to be filed with curl because everyone can read curl, or at least kind of can read curl. 
you can figure it out, and most people can get a bash console and just paste it in and make it happen. So this is why it's curl. Um, we so back to back a little bit uh, with um, we say on the on the GitHub site that Elasticsearch is a restful uh, blah 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 distributed analytics engine. We say restful. Realistically, what that means is that we pay attention to HTTP verbs. We try to be standards compliant to the HTTP spec. And we borrow RESTful concepts when they make sense, and we totally ignore them when, we, when they don't. And when you come to us and you're pedantic and you say, this is not a RESTful database, we say, OK. <laughs> it, it, it isn't. But this, this actually is quite RESTful. Look, look. You put the document where you want it to be. So this is a document here. I'm way out of frame. Aren't I? <laughs> I, you put the, the, the document, see the thing in the little quotes, the, the J. Uh, that's the thing you're indexing. You use an HTTP put to put it in this three part URL. So you see, I've put in pink uh, on the fourth line uh, three things. That's the, that's the lo location of your document. Uh, the first one is called the index, the second one is called the type, and the third one is called the ID. They are all strings to us. Even though that's a one, that's a string. We don't, we don't care that, it, that it's a number. Um, so yeah, IanWiki on this slide is the type, or is the index, sorry. Doc is the type, and one is the ID. Sorry. So. Nowadays, you actually can file bug reports against Elasticsearch using another syntax. This is the only other syntax that we will really accept you to file bug reports. And this is this funny reduced syntax that's supported by Kibana's development tools. Uh, and I'm going to use that syntax, this syntax from here on out, because it's a lot shorter than this. And uh, it says the same thing. So with maybe two regexes and a half dozen lines of JavaScript, you can turn this into a curl command. There's actually a button. And so in all the Elasticsearch documentation, it looks like this. There's a button on the website that says copy as curl. It's like, I wrote it. It's like one regex and 12 lines of JavaScript. It's not so bad. But I'm going to use this, this uh, way of writing it to save space so that you don't have to write the content type and curl dash age and all the other stuff. Um, Sometimes I, I use curl to interact with Elasticsearch. Sometimes I use Kibana to interact with Elasticsearch. I use curl if I ever want to write a loop, like bash loop. You know, bash is good. Anyway, t finally, diagram time. <laughs> so this this command here, where you where you put the document at a URL, this is physically what happens. You pick a random node, any node you want, doesn't matter, and you throw the document like that little man that I made. Uh, into any one of your nodes, doesn't matter, and it will take it will take that three-part URL, and the first thing it does is it looks at the index. So an index in Elasticsearch is a collection of documents configured a certain way. When you talk to Elasticsearch's API, you talk about indexes. On disk, Elasticsearch, I mean, Elasticsearch cares about indexes, but internally, Elasticsearch cares a lot more about charts, which are how the indexes are broken up. This picture, if you remove all of the arrows, is of that Ian Wiki index from the previous slides. Sharded two ways, replicated two ways. So it may be hard to read, but uh, node 0 has Ian, Wiki, Ian Wiki's 0 replica, and node 1 also has the other copy of Ian Wiki's 0 replica. And then in wikis, one replica is on node zero, and yeah, you get the idea. So when you go to put a document in the index, Elasticsearch takes the type and the ID, squashes them together, hashes them, and mods them by the number of shards, and pitches them onto that shard. So what it'll do is it will forward the, the indexing request from the node that you sent the document to, whichever one it was, to the node, to a node with a copy of the appropriate shard. So in this case, my little picture says that Ian Wiki doc one 
Uh, I am assuming that it hashes and goes into the to the one shard rather than the zero shard. So when we have so in our case we have two shards. You can have more. It's fine. Doesn't matter. Or sorry, in our case you can have two replicas. You can have more. It's fine. But only one of those replicas is the primary replica. And that is the replica that gets the document first. So what it does is it drops the, sticks the documents in that replica's translog. It f-syncs the translog and buffers the document to be added to search and then fires off the request to go to the other replica. So I don't know if I can, I can't stick my mouse over there. Anyway, that firing, the document off to go to the other replica is this bottom left pink arrow. Pink is our color. So I get to use pink for all my highlights. It's great. So the shard number one, or sorry, node two, which is this replica shard, does the same thing as the first shard did. It sticks the document in the translog, f syncs the translog, buffers the document to be written, and then it replies back to node one, or back to node zero, sorry, which had the primary. And then the primary collects all of the replies from all the replicas. In this case, there's one. And then it immediately replies back to the user. So you see this with Elasticsearch all the time. Internally, you make a request to some random node. That random node forwards the request to the appropriate spot. Or maybe that random node forks the request out to a bunch of places. They come back. And then it all sort of reverses. So it's very much a, the request goes out, whittles around the, the cluster some, and then the whole path is reversed. So getting a document looks fairly similar to putting a document. Same thing happens. You look up the index uh, by, by well, the place in the URL. You take the type and the ID and hash them, and you pick a shard. In this case, though, um, Elasticsearch round robins, which of the copies uh, the get comes from. So. Even though you sent the request to node zero, we still round robin it. Sometimes it goes to node one. Sometimes it goes to node one. Sometimes it goes to node zero. Doesn't matter, or at least to us it doesn't matter. Maybe it does to you, uh, but this is what we do. Uh, and then node one fetches the document off a disk and replies to re replies to node zero, which then replies to you. So the thing you get back is pretty much what you put in, plus some metadata. Uh, we put in stuff like the we add like a version to the document, and we tell you what index it was stored in, and a couple other things. But you mostly just get back the source that you gave us. So, get is pretty boring. Let's do searches. They're much more fun. Come on, it's 9 a.m., 9.13 a.m. So this is a very simple, basic search. Um, keeping in REST land, or, or, or REST parlance, you post to a, a special search endpoint. I'm not sure if this is appropriate from a REST standpoint, but it's what we do. Um, and then you give a JSON structure that describes the search that you want to do. In this case, this search says, do all the default things, plus add a query that only returns documents that have the word small and domestic in their text field. So let's go back and look at our cat document here. So we, are, we have three fields here, a title, a text, and a popularity score. The text, in this case, has uh, small and domestic. So the, what I'm trying to do is make a search that will find this document. Oh, and the other thing is that it ranks, the, it ranks all the documents. Remember how I talked about ranks documents based on how small and how domestic they are. And it gives you the top 10, because that's the default. This is how search works. Isn't it exciting? The little man throws his request at node 0 again. And the first thing we, have to, we do is pick the index again. And then we talk to all the shards. Same deal. You say round robining again, which shard you talk to. But we talk to the, the shard 0 and the shard 1. Right? We can talk to any replica of the shard 0 or the shard 1, but we have to talk to both shard 0 and shard 1 because we don't know on which shard has the best small and domestic documents. In this case, since we only put one document in the index, we just don't even know which shard has any documents in it. 
So first we contact all these nodes. Each, each shard individually counts all the matching documents and makes a priority queue of the highest scoring documents and returns that. The node where you sent the original request merges the priority queue of the scored documents. Now the next thing that makes this more complicated is actually an optimization, but it's a very important optimization. I'll get into in more depth. So the second thing that it does is that that node, node zero that you originally sent the request to, after it merges the priority queues together, turns back around and requests from node one and node two the actual body of the documents to return to you. And you may be thinking, oh, that's cute, right? It's saving on some network transmission. It doesn't have to send all of the documents. And that's going to save a lot of network transmission if there are many shards or if the documents are large, right? So say, say you had 10 shards, and they all made this priority queue of documents, and then they all sent back the bodies of all the documents. It would be a fair amount of network overhead that you don't need. But it's actually much more important than that. Oh, cute. It happens to, in this case, um, but it can't serve the full text of the document. It's, I will explain in a minute. Um, this is actually a sequence diagram uh, uh, of the thing that I just described, right? So you send the request off to node one, it forks the request off, to, uh, so you send the request to node zero, sorry, it forks the request to no node one and node two for the query. The query phase is that thing that goes and builds the priority queue, identifies the hits, it comes back. They come back asynchronously, and when the last one comes back, we kick off that fetch phase where we go, oh, well, first we merge the priority queues once enough of them have come back, and then we kick off the fetch phase to go fetch those documents, and when they finally come back, we reply to the user, to you. My notes say I should be nine minutes in, I'm currently 17, so this is going well. Um, I, will, I promise I will get to your, your answer very soon. So it's now time to talk about data structures. And the reason it's time to talk about data structures is I want to make it clear why we have to do this two-phase thing. But to do that, I just sort of show how the queries work and how fetching the source works. And then I'll get to your answer. So. These data structures are all internally maintained on every shard. Each shard gets its own copy of the data structures and builds it when, when or rather, each shard internally grows its own copies of the data structures, uh, and they they diverge. So, so uh, shard copy, the first shard, the primary shard copy, and the replica shard copies potentially have totally different on disk structures representing the same data because they, well, because we only replicate the actions that are add this document and, and delete this document and things like that. We don't replicate the actual on-disk files most of the time. So the other sort of nice thing to know is that internally, so inside the shard, every document has an integer ID. That's a, it's a signed int, even though we only use the 31 bits of it. Uh, but it's a signed int. Um, and each document gets a different ID on a different shard because we're not replicating the, uh, the actual on the structure again. We're replicating the, the please add this document to this index. And so they will get a different synthetic integer ID. So while I've talked about integer IDs, this is actually how text search is done. Uh, this is a data structure called a finite state transducer. Uh, it's a really fancy name, but um, uh, if you have a computer science degree, you have seen a, a finite automata before. That's a thing that's designed to uh, say this part, uh, say this word is part of this grammar. It looks a lot like this too. Essentially, there's some, every time you want Every time you, you, you want to look up a letter, say I wanted to look up the word cap, I start at the root and I move over into the node that's with the appropriate label. All right, so I could trace cat up to C, A, and T. And then I see that cat, because that's the end of my word, I know I'm done, so I can follow the link out of, out of it into the uh, data structure that it points to. So uh, a finite state automata only has a yes or a no at the end of uh, these at the end of its chains, and a finite state transducer 
has a data structure at the end of its chain. So instead of saying, yes, this is part of this grammar, it says, it is part of this grammar, and you can go learn more about it over here. So at the end of, the, at the end of this finite state transducer, we have a list of document IDs. These are IDs that have, that have the term in them. So uh, just for illustrative purposes, we're going to say that our cat document is 1, uh, because it's the first one we stuck in the index. So let's just call it 1, because that makes our life easier. Um, and so you can see that the word carnivore is also represented in this structure. I put the dot, dot, dots over here. So it shares the prefix and then moves on. So text searches, like a regular, a regular search for a term that says, like, I want to look up the word cat. It actually just walks the data structure. And then it gets to the end and it moves on. And it jumps to, jumps to the, um, the associated data. A prefix search walks to the end of the prefix, and then it iterates over this whole tree, finding all of the terms that are in there, merges the document list of all the terms together, and walks back. Regexes create a um, deterministic finite automata and intersect the deterministic finite automata with the um, finite state transducer, which is actually, that's a lot of really fancy words, but it's not all that complicated. Uh, the way the way it does it, they're sort of built to be intersected. So there are a bunch of other data structures of Elasticsearch um, that power these queries, but I'm not really going to get into them because I'm absolutely not an expert in them. Um, but I will name drop. Them. They're kind of cool. You can go look them up if you want. Um, if you want to do a phrase query, that is, say, I want to look for documents that have the word cat and then the word, or the word cat, and then the word carnivorous right after it. Uh, to do that, not only do you have to do these term lookups, but then you have to go to another data structure, uh, which there's, not shown here, but there's actually a link to that data structure from the end of the, these term lists. And that data structure is a skip list that contains all of the positions of all of the documents, or all of the positions of the terms within the documents. So let's look at our cat document. Uh, the, the term V would be at position 0, the term domestic at position 1, the term cat at position 2, on and on and on. So these positions are saved, uh, and they're used to power these phrase searches. The other interesting data structure that, that we get is something called a BKD tree, which is like a binary tree, but, but uh, generalized to work in multiple dimensions. So uh, if you just have, like, if, if you're just indexing a number, then it just sort of looks like a binary tree. But if you're indexing uh, a shape or a position on the Earth or something like that, then it looks more complex. And I don't actually know how they work. Um, but I will name check them so you can go look them up if you want. Um, but the take home message from this slide is that what a query does is it finds those integer IDs. It doesn't find the ID that you gave us. It finds this synthetic integer ID that we made up when you handed the document to us. And it doesn't find the document's text. The document's text is off somewhere else. In fact, the document's text is stored in this thing called stored fields. So that second phase, what it does is it loads three things from the stored field. It loads the ID, it loads the type, and it loads the original source that you gave us, which we call underscore source because we have forever, and I'm not actually sure why. Uh, but but that's what we call the original thing that you gave us. Those things are stored in this thing called stored fields. Stored fields are optimized to save space. So what we do is we take all of the stored fields for a document, we cap them together into a, just a big, basically a big string, and then we chunk those together with other documents, and then we compress them, and then write that to this. So when you want to go load a store field, you have to go to the appropriate place on disk, the appropriate chunk that has your document in it. You have to uncompress far enough to get your document out. And then you have to get the field that you want out of the stored fields. So getting, loading these stored fields is actually a fair bit of work. Um, which is why we have this phase thing. Now, now I can answer your question about why can't the first, why can't why can't one shard serve the source of a document from another shard? 
right? So if another shard ran, ran a query, and you happen to have another copy of that shard on your disk, the reason why a different copy can't serve the source is because those integer IDs, they don't line up at all. There's just no guarantee that, they, that, they're, that they're the same. Sometimes they are. Uh, in particular, they are the same after a shard fails and we replicate the files on disk. Uh, but we actually try to do that as little as possible because it's a lot of work. There's still a lot of data to copy around. So that was an easy search. Let's talk about a slightly better one. Uh, this search has the same query in it. I squashed the JSON so that it wouldn't take up so much space. Um, and then it asks Elasticsearch to do another thing when it's finding the document. So you remember how I told you that Elasticsearch builds a priority queue of all of the documents on, on each shard? Yes? Good? All right. Well, it always counts them when it, when it builds that priority queue at the same time. But you can ask it to do more things. In this case, uh, well, those more things could be as simple as take the average of some field. Uh, in this case, it says take the average, min, max, variance, and something else. Um, extended stats calculates a whole bunch of stats at the same time uh, on this one field. You can also ask it to do things like uh, group the documents by uh, certain field values or group the documents based on date ranges or number ranges and things like that or IP address ranges uh, and then calculate values based on those groups. So you could calculate uh, how much, like you could calculate the average inbound traffic for a certain um, IP address range, right, for a certain group of nodes. So. Remember from the last slide, this, uh, these stored fields are chunked and compressed. It would be a nightmare to service these requests from the stored fields because you'd have to go to each one, un uncompress it. You're probably doing them in the wrong order, so they're not necessarily uncompressing them in the order that you actually want them in. It would be a nightmare to serve these aggregations out of stored fields. So instead, we use something called doc values. Doc values is a third way that everything is stored on disk. So if stored, field, if stored fields map from the doc that synthetic ID to a list of fields to the values, doc values map from a field to the doc ID to the value. So instead of taking all of the values and compressing them, or and chunking them and compressing them together like stored fields, what doc values does is it does uh, numeric tricks and lookup tables and things along those lines. So it knows about statistics of the fields about how it stores them. And, and that's how it compresses them. So say, for example, you have only 10 values ever for this particular field. Well, the thing will know, oh, there are 10 values. Uh, it will make a lookup table for all 10 of them, and then each document will get a nibble, so four bits, because that's enough to address 10. Uh, and each document will get a nibble for which value it has, so it, you need only half a byte to store all of these values, which is fairly good. Um, it gets worse. Uh, floating point numbers compress very poorly. This is almost nothing you can do about floating point numbers. They just take up a lot of space. So we've been thinking about ways to make them better. But if you are curious about the way that this compression works, and it's really quite interesting, some of the best talks I've ever had, you can go look these talks up online, and I won't steal any of their thunder, but amusing algorithms and details on data structures, and all about Elasticsearch algorithms and data structures. These were two years, uh, these were one, two years in a row at Elasticon. Um, great talks, they were some of my favorite. So, remember back on that indexing slide that I said that each that when I try to index documents, I put them in a buffer, right? I put them in a trans log, I have synced the trans log, and I put the shards, I put the documents in a buffer to be made ready for search. We don't immediately make the documents ready for search. And the reason for that 
is that all of these data structures, like the finite state transducer and the duck values, they're right once. Uh, rather, they're immutable. Uh, what that means is that uh, you write them, and then if you want to modify them, you have to rewrite them. Um, and this is actually really, really useful. Uh, but it's the it's sort of an interesting caveat. So what, what ends up happening because of this behavior is that a bunch of documents come in, we buffer them up, and then we build a little packet of data structures for them and save that packet to disk. Then more documents come in, and we build another little packet and save that to disk. And more documents come in, and we build another little packet and save that to disk. That packet has a special name. It's called segment. And the act of building a new segment is called refreshing in Elasticsearch. So turns out, oh, the other important thing is the way that everything is done is by iterating over these segments. So every single search action starts by, for each segment, do these things, collect the values, and do, and do something with the result. Having hundreds of these segments would be very slow to search on because these, these data structures are sort of designed to save space when there are lots of similar documents. And if, these, if, if, the, if the segments are tiny, then it is inefficient to run through them because there's more overhead per segment. There's more on disk overhead, so you've got uh, disk caching problems, and there's more memory overhead, and there's more CPU overhead because you have to deal with navigating those data structures. So there's an asynchronous operation called merging that takes these small segments, squashes them into a big segment, and leaves the small segments around until nobody needs the small segments anymore, and then deletes them and moves over. So I tried to illustrate that in this slide, but I think it kind of sucks. Um, but this is actually the process that allows that. Do you remember how there are the two phases? Well, if you modify the index in between those two phases, then the second phase may not work, right? The, the document may not be there anymore. It may be a different version. So we can't allow that. So what we do is we pin the, the segments, we pin all the old ones. They still exist until that second phase is complete. And Elasticsearch has this thing called uh, scroll, which is where you, you run a query and then you say, I'll come back and get more results and get more results and get more results. It's kind of like a database's cursor. And just like a database's cursor, it has a consistent view of the index. And the way that it has that consistent view is that it keeps a pointer. Literally, it's just reference counting and pointers to, to keep these files in existence. And then eventually, when the scroll either times out or is closed, is closed or finishes all its documents or something like that, we can actually delete these files. The other thing is that this is the only process that reclaims space for deleted documents. So uh, Elasticsearch works fairly similarly to unoptimized Postgres for uh, deleted documents. That means is that uh, when a document, when, when you make an update, you have to delete the old document and add a new one. And this is atomic on the shard level, but that's how updates work, and that's how deletes work. They just delete the document. But all that does is it has a, a data structure that is basically a bitmap that marks the documents as deleted. And so those are filtered out from the queries fairly early on, but they still sit around on disk. The only process that actually removes all that stuff off of disk for these documents is this merging process. We just don't copy anything for documents that are deleted. All right. I promise it's not, this is way over what I thought it would be, but it's still good time. Still good time. So let's talk about analysis. Because uh, this, this is where I start to, to try to make that search stuff make sense, try to make the uh, fancy, text, fancy full text search make sense. So. <laughs> Say I want to search for the word Latin. Well, any sane person would want to find the cat document somewhere in that list. Maybe not high. I mean, it has the word Latin. It's close to the beginning of the document. Maybe that's important. But the word Latin, you should find the word Latin. And if you were to, to take the whole, the whole document and just save it, as a, or take the whole text field right there and save it as a single term, 
if you were to make the finite state transducer T H E space D O M and all that, all the way around, so the finite state chain transducer was super long, then the only way to find the word Latin would be to have a wildcard query that has uh, a wildcard in the front and a wildcard in the back, and the word Latin in the middle. And this is super inefficient because the way that these things have to be evaluated is you have to walk all the way up the finite state transducer and go, oh, there's no L, and then go back. You end up having to walk the entire thing. And that's really, really inefficient. So instead, what we do is we play with the text before it's indexed. So the first step in this analysis is called tokenization. And it's where you take the text and you divide it into words. So uh, to make this example easy, I'm going to use a stupid tokenizer. It just tokenizes on white space. I'm not going to use a smart one that tokenizes on like open paren and periods and stuff. The real tokenizers do that by default. But I'm going to use white space because white space makes this mm. more illustrative. So the very first thing we do is we tokenize this sentence into words. But if you search for Latin, you still won't find the word. Because there's that silly parenthesis and the colon and all that other business. You're not going to find it. So the usual next step. So we just do it right now, is to lowercase all the terms. Uh, we'll get to why this, this works really well, but pretend I'm just searching for lowercase Latin for now. I want to find it lowercase, even if it is uppercase here. Then we apply another filter. In this case, uh, the filter that I applied to make this work was called pattern replace. And I just made a pattern replace that replaces things like open paren and colon and period with nothing. So that gets us to this gold line. The gold line is gold because it is the first line that finds the word Latin, and also because gold is one of Elastic's official accent colors. And it comes with our, actually, I, I, like, I really sort of make fun of this, but it's so useful to have a company just hand you a slide deck and say, this is how you start. It's really easy. I don't have to pick accent colors or anything. I love it. Um, so the next thing I often do, but don't always do, is do something called stemming which is where you take each one of these words and you um, deconjugate them. So this pink line is where I applied something called case stem, which is a stemmer from like 1990s or something. Um, and it works fairly well. Uh, it's, it's well studied and it does, does a decent job of finding words. So what it does is it takes your words and mangles them. right? So see like domestic becomes, becomes domest and Felis becomes feely, uh, and carnivorous becomes carnivore without an E. So the reason this is cool is that now you can actually find the word, you can find the cat document if you search for carnivore. Most reasonable people would want to find information about cats if they search for carnivore. Eventually, right? It may not be high on the list, but they want to find it. So the way this works, the, the usual way that you do these searches is that you use this thing called a match query. And what that does is it runs the, the text that you handed us through the same analysis chain, through this same step. And carnivore also becomes carnivore without the E. So you can still find your cat document because everyone wants to find cats. Now, in Elasticsearch, as in Lucene, as in, oh god, I said Lucene. I'll, I'll explain Lucene in a bit. Um, in Elasticsearch, you can turn off this analyze the text I just gave you behavior by using a term query instead of a match query. Um, there's technically some overhead in asking us to do a match query, uh, but it's realistically so tiny that it's, I just always use match queries, unless there's a, a really compelling reason not to. So. There is a trick that is fairly common, and I used it at Wikipedia. Um, what you do is you analyze the text two ways. You analyze the text both with and without a stemmer, right? So basically, what this does, what I did to build this slide was I deleted the top three lines and moved the table up. These are the same lines. So the golden text is the analyzed text, and the pink text is the analyzed text with the stemmer. And Often, what's nice is to be able to find documents 
um, higher in the list if they have exactly the term that you searched for. So one way to do this that works fairly well is to only apply, or is to apply the stemming to one field and to not apply it to another and to search on both and to explicitly say the unstemmed field is worth more. And it looks like that. Now, I like this example because it's fairly real world. I mean, I actually did it on a real website that really finds hits that people, they, they think the search is okay. Not great, but okay, right? Like, to make a great search, you have to do a lot of analytics and you have to basically spy on your users and figure out whether they liked the search or not and then optimize it. I think I made the best search I could without doing that. So this is one of the tricks that you do. And I also like this example because it shows that the Elasticsearch query language, while really big and bloaty with JSON, like, I mean, this is just massive for what it does. But it's eminently composable. Right? It's, it's obvious the places where you can stick queries, or at least it should be in the documentation, and if it isn't, you can bug me and I'll fix it. And when you stick another query in there, you can use any of the other, you can use the query language again, right? It's fully, fully, the queries can be fully embedded in themselves, and that just works. And JSON kind of actually is a good structure for that, because it's sort of naturally tree based, and that makes sense. It's, Sort of nicer sometimes than a like a fancy than a fancy like uh, way like a than a fancy like one liner looking query would be because JSON is sort of naturally tree like. Okay, so I'm done of slides. This is it. Well, th this is the last one. Um, so. There's my summary. There's the things that you should probably remember uh, from this talk, that I hope that you remember from this talk. I hope that the data structures were interesting, at least the ones that I had time to go into and that I went into it in, in, in any depth. But the things to, to remember are that, well, I could just read the slide, but just remember these things. These are the important ones. Um, particularly that requests bounce around asynchronously is, is interesting, that we write data to disk in a bunch of different ways is interesting. Uh, and each different way is to optimize a different access pattern. And that analysis, analyzing the text, that stuff that I went into in the last slide, is like super important to get a nice search experience. Uh, and it's the way that you make search fast is by screwing with the text both before, both before you index it and at search time, uh, rather than any sort of fancy uh, thing that you do at query time, just do the simplest possible thing at query time, which is look up the text the user typed to you. Anything you can do to, to transform your search problem into that, and it'll be fast. So that's what you can remember. Now, I said the word Lucene uh, earlier, and I didn't explain it. Um, Elasticsearch is, Lucene is a library, is a Java library that implements like, I don't know, three quarters of this stuff. Elasticsearch implements things like the bouncing around, the network, things like, um, well, JSON, the, the whole JSON stuff. All, everything to do with JSON is an Elasticsearch invention. It's, uh, Lucene is a Java library, so it's working at, a, at the Java library layer. But Lucene implements things like doc values, it implements the queries, it implements the analysis, uh, and Elasticsearch is, is built on Lucene. Many of the Elasticsearch contributors are Lucene contributors. Not all, uh, and not all of the Lucene contributors are Elasticsearch contributors. Lucene is an Apache project. Elasticsearch is basically an Elastic company project that's open source. Uh, so um, that isn't to say that Lucene has all the brains, uh, but it's got an awful lot of the brains. Uh, and a lot of the brains that I covered today are actually Lucene brains. Uh, mostly because it has the interesting data structures. Elasticsearch is just a big pile of software engineering work, and um, yeah, to make it all, to make it all exposed over HTTP. So, questions? Here, I'll go to the to the Creative Commons slide so we can ask questions. That's the official trigger. Shoot. Uh, so, to the audience this year, uh, can you explain a little bit? Is it that nodes one and two are the shards and node zero is just like 
Yeah, sure. So when Elastic, so the question was, I will repeat it so that it gets recorded, is please explain how shards work. You sort of glossed over that. And I did. Um, so, and I also didn't explain that node 0, node 1, and node 2 are physical, uh, they're, they're actual nodes. Uh, in my mind, they are different computers uh, sitting in a data center. Uh, but they could simply be different Java processes and we wouldn't notice or care. Um, so, Elasticsearch can be run uh, with nodes configured in a bunch of ways, a couple of ways. Uh, essentially, there are flags that you can turn on and off. Um, you can turn on and off whether a node ha has data on disk. So, in, in my case, this picture has, has three nodes, which are three physical machines. They all have data written on disk. And Elasticsearch has tried to balance those that data on disk as best that it can. There are four things that it has to balance three ways, so one node just gets extra. Sorry. Um, so this is that. The other thing about shards is, is that the number of shards is set on index creation. There's a special API you can use called shrink, which makes it smaller. Uh, but there are funny rules like it can only be, you can only decrease it to a multiple, or decrease it from a multiple of what it was. So if you had 10 shards, you can decrease to 2 or 5 or 1. Um, in any case, so the, the process, hmm, how to describe it? So these shards are these data structures on disk. And most of those, so internally inside Elasticsearch, shards are fairly independent of one another. Um, there's this, uh, rep, this primary replica thing, and uh, the primary is, is the one where the, act, the like the writes go first, and then uh, so in in my case, in this picture, this this uh, shard on node zero is the primary for uh, this particular write operation. Uh, so that means that for the Ian Wiki uh, one shard, this is the 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 one on node zero is the primary until the end of time. Uh, rather, until something goes wrong. So node, nodes keep, nodes stay, rather, shards, shard copies, to be, we talk, we start talking about them as shard copies. So like, this guy's a shard copy, and this guy's a shard copy, right? So shard copies stay primary as long as they can, and if something tragic happens, like, someone shoots node, node zero, well, then the other node, then the other copy gets promoted to the primary. But otherwise, the things stay primary for a while. Um, so the other thing that makes sharding work uh, is that we hash the document, like we hash by the type in the ID and just put the documents in there. So from a document's URL, you can tell which shard it goes into. Like, that's the magic of it. There are ways that you can cheat this. You can, uh, there, there are features like parent-child and features like routing. Uh, that basically takes control from Elasticsearch and says, no, no, I know where this document goes. Uh, but when you do that, uh, the ID, uniqueness of IDs can get violated if you don't always do it right. It's one of those keys that Elasticsearch hands to you and says, you can override our sharding algorithm if you feel like it. Just don't screw it up, or you'll get duplicate IDs now. Um, I know that was sort of a rambly talk about shards, but... No, you get a match from any node. It's round robin. So where do you uh, uh, get rid of these bits in the results? So the way that you get rid of duplicate, duplicates in the results is by always sending the same document to the same node. Right? So, or rather, always sending documents to the same shard. So if the document with ID 1 gets hashed to, to the shard number 1, it always has to get hashed to shard number 1, or else we start to make duplicates. So because they always go to the same shard, you can just pick any one of those shards and get the result back. Now, the interesting thing about this is that uh, from a database, like a transactional database point of view, this has all kinds of bad properties. For example, you get uh, dirty reads uh, if the nodes crash. Uh, you can get dirty reads. You can get um, stale reads. Uh, all of these things are totally possible and exacerbated by our refresh cycle. 
So we have this cycle where we refresh every once in a while. Remember where we make the, pack, the segments? We only do that by default every second. And in fact, when people have a high write rate, we tell them to crank that up. We tell them to put that at like 30 seconds or a minute or something like that. In that case, if the nodes refreshes don't line up, and they never will, why would they, right? Like, just like that's how the world works, then if you go to a different node, you'll actually get different documents visible. You'll get the old version of a document visible over here and the new version over here. And one of the ways that we fight this is by updates always being done on the primary. But in truth, um, there's actually a, another really great talk by a guy named Afer that you can go, that you can go watch, where he just blows away our consistency model. He says, nope, it's crap. And uh, actually, it is. Um, but uh, the, it's getting better constantly. Um, there are a lot of smart people who are, who are working hard on the consistency model. Uh, and one of the problems with the consistency model is that dirty reads can, if, if, you, if you do an update, so we have, this, we have a system for updates that allows you to do um, uh, optimistic locking, right? You say, only update this if the version is the same, right? We don't have any sort of locking. We have this optimistic concurrency control. So same thing Postgres has, everyone's got it. Uh, you say, make this update only if this version matches. That works great. But in the case of dirty reads, you can get version, you can get documents back with the version that you wanted, but it turns out that they actually have not the data that you thought they had. I keep getting text. Anyway, um, this is a problem. And actually, one of the ways that we, that, that we can fight this and that, that we are currently working on to fight it uh, is that the way these dirty reads happen is when one primary fails, when the, when the primary fails and you, you read instead from a replica, the, the versions can diverge. And if you, instead of use these version numbers, if you use... Um, a, the sequence that the no, the sequence that things were written to the primary plus uh, the generation of the primary, and that is every time a primary dies, you get a new generation. So if you use these two these two things together, then you can prevent these these dirty updates. The trouble is though that update semantics isn't implemented yet. It's coming, but it isn't implemented yet. What that means is that uh, Elasticsearch is 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 very useful. Uh, for the things that it is useful for. And that those are indexing and searching and finding data quickly. But uh, as a primary data store, I would avoid it until we get that. Uh, and even then, there are still other things. So I didn't just, so this is the, the consistency model I just described is how, um, how shards work. You put a document in the shard, and if the primary says the document, says the document goes in the primary, then you basically could reply to the user immediately and tell them, yep, it's in. Because if any of the replicas fail, then they get shot. So if, if the primary accepts a document and a replica rejects it, the replica has to die. That's just the way that this consistency model works. And then the replica has to be rebuilt someplace else because something must be wrong with it, so just blow it away from orbit. What's the main use case? The main use case is powering on-site search or powering... Um, like analytics on logs or, um, let's see, uh, powering. People will do things like they'll collect a bunch of NetFlow data and they'll dump it in and they'll analyze it. It is essentially, uh, so works great if you only write one time. Uh, it works fine if you want to write multiple times, but there's some other source of truth. Those are the two things. Uh, but it is not a relational database and it's getting better. Uh, but I would not trust it with my, as my primary data store. That, that's fine. I never did, right? So it powered the on-site search and Wikipedia, right? When you go to, in the upper right, there's a search bar. And you just type things in there and it finds things. Most people don't know about it, but if you happen to use the Wikipedia app on your phone, um, there's a search on there and that uses it. And that generates tons of traffic. So while most people don't know about it, it still gets more search traffic than like MSN does because Wikipedia is stupidly huge. So it works, right? It works for that. And the reason it works for that is that there's a second, there's a primary data store that's outside of it. And that the process of keeping Elasticsearch up to date is this asynchronous triggered process that happens after someone modifies a page 
in Wikipedia. It's actually really complicated in Wikipedia because Wikipedia, Wikipedia pages don't just... So if you've ever edited uh, a wiki, usually, if you've edited a corporate wiki, what happens is you just type text and you click save. This is not how, how Wikipedia works. Wikipedia is nothing like this. You click edit and then it's a whole friggin' programming language in there. And you can type text, but it turns out that if you want to make a certain box, you invoke a template. And actually, if you get deep enough, some of these templates are written in Lua. Uh, so they're like turn complete, they're like full, because it turns out people were right. People were abusing the templating language to write turn complete code, like to write real code. So someone was like, well, screw this, let's just replace the really horrible templates with Lua. Um, so they did. And actually, it worked great. Uh, Brad's a good guy. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a great choice. So anyway, if you modify any of these templates, you have to go and update the search index for all the pages that, that, that come from these templates. So when some guy goes and modifies the template for Infobox, right? Have you ever been to a Wikipedia, a Wikipedia page without an Infobox? That's this box on the right-hand side that says, like, this country is, you know, <clears throat> was founded at this time, has this population, you know, or this species is this Latin name or whatever. So there's this big echo process in the Wikipedia search engine. Uh, with updates. But, so that's the, the use case. There are lots of use cases. Just primary data store isn't one of them yet. Um, that was a very long answer to one question, and it is very close to time for me to stop. But I can keep answering questions, and after I finish your, with your question, I will be available at the table directly outside that door, which is Elastic Stable. We are a sponsor. It's great. Shoot. Uh, yeah, we can do that too. I mean, I, I I do have two whole minutes to answer questions, and then I can go. I mean, I'll be at the for like three days. I will try to go to some talks though, so you may miss me. Any other questions? Yeah. That's primarily for increasing the actual speed of the index. So, when I talked about statistics, I actually t talked about statistics that are calculated on the fly based on a query that you do. So, when when you do a query like this, we can't service these statistics from any cache or from any pre-calculated space. Because you can stick any query you want here in the top, right? In this case, you're you're only calculating the uh, the statistics about the prob the popularity score of pages that have the words small and domestic in them, right? So you get things about cats, things about dogs and stuff, but you don't get things about tigers. Um, so none of this stuff can be can be pre pre calculated. This stuff is all calculated on the fly, and it's all done by visiting all these documents with this doc values uh, doc values data structure. Uh, well, so kind of. Um, yes, it's ephemeral, but there is a cache, uh, and there is a very smart cache. Uh, so Elasticsearch has like several different layers of caching depending on where you are. Um, certain things like filters are cached, uh, so that's the queries without score. Uh, the, the matching documents are cached, uh, and those work really, really well uh, because of that write once nature, nature of the data structure. Uh, so that's cool. Um, the other thing that, that we cache is we actually cache the whole result of your query. Uh, so if you came back to us within a couple of seconds and nobody else had blown the cache open, yeah, we could give you the same thing back. And this is actually really a common use case, if you believe it, because what people do is they use a tool called Kibana, which is a, um, it's a web app that lets you sort of slice and dice, uh, and it's, it's designed for, for working with data that's like time series and playing with it and making dashboards and making reports on things. So what'll happen is someone will make a dashboard and they'll save it, and then like 50 people will open it, or it'll be like on a bunch of monitors, and each monitor will be on a computer. So it's actually fairly common that we get really high cache hit rates for these dashboards. Now, one thing that's very interesting is that if you stick a time range in, uh, especially if that time range has now in it, it's very hard to cache this. So what people often do when, they, when they're making uh, these Kibana dashboards is instead of writing one index, they write an index per day or an index per week, 
an index per hour, or an index per whatever. We don't care. We, we just don't know. And, and you can do what you want. We actually we have tools that help you, but whatever. What we have uh, in, in this cache is that uh, before we make the cache key, we rewrite the query based on statistics of the data that's on the current. So this is where we do use these statistics. For example, we use the min and maximum time for a time. So any column, any column that looks like a time, or looks like a number, or look, anything that we can turn into a number. Uh, if you have a range query, which is what a time query is, so you might have a huge range that says like you know a month worth of data, and that actually ends up having to target thirty indexes because we have maybe daily indexes, and but. For 28 of those indexes, or 29 of those indexes, uh, it's literally hitting the entire index, right? It's, it's the time range is across the whole index. So if we rewrite the query before we make that cache key to the two sides of the index, then it's the same query, right? So that's actually one of the fancy features in 5.0. It's called Instant Kibana, and the person who made it hates that name. Um, I, I just love that he hates it. Um, and he, he was so he he on on his on his node like in his house he captures you know performance statistics over and over and over again on, on about some desktop he has or something some something he captures something it's, it's running all the time his months worth of data and he's like look here's Elasticsearch without Instant Kibana and it takes like I don't know like a second two seconds to render to render this dashboard. And then he goes, here's Elasticsearch with Instant Kibana. And the first time he does it, it's like, OK, there's, there's your second. And then the second time, it's like four milliseconds. I'm like, OK, that's, that's pretty instant. Uh, you know, a couple orders of magnitude better. I mean, because it's cheating, right? It's caching. Caching is cheating. But any way you can cheat, you should um, That's what we do. Uh, but it only works, for example, like if the index isn't modified. Well, actually, that's very common. Not in the on-site search use case, so Wikipedia never gets to use this cache because its indexes are always modified and, and it has a very long tail of searches. So it doesn't matter. But for these uh, dashboards, actually it's very common that those old indices are never modified. Anyway, I've blown through all my time and it's been lovely. Thank you and I'll be at that table after.